write the new tech order. You know, we've heard so much about the new world order and what, what's the shape of the world going to be looking like. But actually what we are seeing right now is a whole cascade of technologies. There's a whole group of technologies all advancing at an exponential pace. And that probably means that the world 10 years from now, perhaps even five years from now, is going to look really different to what it is right now. Now that could be good. Hopefully it will be good. Hopefully this new tech order is going to save climate change and all the other problems we've been talking about all through the day, healthcare, you name it. It could also be bad. There could be positives and negatives. So how do we do it? How do we navigate this new tech order? We've got a fantastic panel joining us to, to take us through all of that. Uh, uh, Paresh Deshmukh is the uh, group CEO of, the Bas of Basic Partners. Thank you for, for being with us. Sunena Aitan is a, a cybersecurity consultant, Airbus Project. Um, Ivana Bartoletti, Vice President, Global Chief AI Governance and Privacy Officer, Wipro. That, that title is an interesting title. I'm going to actually start with just that. Uh, and uh, uh, Umesh Hachdev is CEO and co-founder of Unifor. Thanks for being with us. And as I said, uh, Ivana, ju just the fact that you have Wipro, one of the big you know, uh, global giants, um, with a global chief AI governance officer, says a lot about the world we're headed to, right? <laughs> it does. And uh, I think we are very much at the watershed moment in the relationship between humanity and technology. And it could go either way. And I think it's really important what you said. I'm very optimistic. I think we all are. And I think we're all optimistic. And sometimes we, when we talk about the risks, we do so because, I mean, at least for me, and I think you were the same, we love technology so much that we sure. want it to work, you know, to work for people and for humanity. So this is, we are at a very interesting moment right now. AI governance, so we pro and, and in the title, because um, when you innovate with AI, you want to do so in a responsible manner. Now, AI is regulated in the sense that it does not exist in isolation. Privacy legislation, consumer law, human rights law, all of this apply to AI. There is new regulation coming in to govern the behavior of businesses around AI. But obviously, you want to do it in a responsible manner. So that's where companies now, they are having these jobs. Uh, mine started with privacy. And the reason is because a lot of the harms coming from AI are privacy harms. So there is a very good connection between the two and a lot of privacy professionals are also being very much involved in this. Um, but it's very much of a corporate effort. So the AI governance is very much, a, it's probably the most fascinating field to be in at the moment. And, and there's a lot which I have to talk to you about on that subject, which we will in just a couple of minutes. But let me finish getting everyone's opening remarks on this. A fundamental inflection point in humanity's relation with technology. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Uh, uh, people would say there have been lots of inflection points in the past, the internet, you know, computers, uh, others. Is this something fundamentally different? And are we going to see a process of change that is faster and more radical than any we've seen in history so far? Well, Vikram, you lead me to a very good point. We've, uh, in the last two or three decades, in contemporary history, We've been through two or three major transitions. In the late 90s, early 2000s, it was the internet. Yeah. Yeah. It changed our life for the better, and today we are all here uh, living uh, a better life because of the internet. We saw early 2010s, cloud mobile became the next transition that we all went through. We are currently living through yet another technology transition, this one led by AI. But there's one key difference this time. The pace of innovation exactly. that's occurring right now is unprecedented. I've been in the technology industry, my company Unifor, we've been in the field of AI for the last 16 years, but it used to be the fact that five or six years will go by before a major technology shift would occur. We saw deep networks, we saw natural language systems, then we saw this pace fasten to a couple of years. Today, not 48 hours can go by before a major, not just an incremental shift, but a major technology platform shift is announced by some company or the other, and all of us are, are trying to keep pace with it. What does it mean for all of us uh, citizens? What does it mean for human beings? It means that first of all, this is a transition that's occurring in our lifetime, and it's happening at a pace we, don't, we didn't expect it to happen. Businesses, I call it the age of abundance. Yeah. Any business, much like the early 2000s that failed to become a dot-com then, any business that fails to adopt AI at this pace, will not exist. Yeah. 
two or three years from now. And that's a stark reality. And so embracing AI, understanding the implications for companies, individuals, governments, et cetera, that's truly important. And forums like these where we're talking about both the positives and the potential risks are equally important in terms of society. You referred to the dot-com boom. So that was, that's actually a scary moment from companies. A lot of people representing companies in the room would say, oh my God, that's actually a scary memory to have because we all know what happened with dot-com, right, in 2000. Yes, the internet eventually did transform all of humanity, but the number of companies that went bust because they jumped too early on the dot-com boom. Uh, even today, you have, every time NVIDIA hits a new high, people say, ah, is it the Cisco of, uh, or the Sun Microsystems of this new era? Could that happen once again? There was a so, big bust at that time before the internet really took off. It's great to have history as uh, a teacher to all of us. The dot-com boom was completely different. What we saw then, including companies like Cisco, which are major businesses even today, by the way, we first saw in the dot-com bust, that occurred, the bubble burst in mm. the year 2000, that there were pet.com and companies like that where multiples on revenue went through the roof. Fortunately with Nvidia and others, that's not what's happened. Nvidia's actual earnings every quarter are going through the roof, which means there's an insatiable demand of setting up this AI infrastructure, the new AI factories as Nvidia is calling it around the world. Having said that, each time we have seen a technology boom, .com was first, Bitcoin was the more recent one. We see this phenomenon that there is an initial hype that gets built up and today is no different. We have LLM companies, we have model companies, open source companies, startups that didn't exist 48 uh, uh, quarters ago or two years ago are all of a sudden free revenue, but $2 billion in valuation. So are we likely to see a little bit of a pullback? Yes. But is this wave, is AI beginning to deliver real business implications, government implications? And that tells me that this won't be a permanent damage and we'll find the, the equilibrium really fast. I'm hopeful. Um, Umesh and Sirena, I'm going to throw the same question to both of you, which is, we, yes, there's an intersection of many technologies. Some, perhaps more um, lasting, shall we say, than others. And there are people who have still, a lot, I mean, skepticism around why, where exactly is cryptocurrency going and is it stable? Is it a real business? Is it not a business? There are questions around it. AI, maybe biotech, more, more stable. Which are the technologies that you are seeing around which you think are going to have the most permanent lasting change? So, so basically, means, uh, taking so, a specific point from what Umesh said just now is uh, we have to embrace AI, but we can't embrace AI for the sake of embracing AI. AI is a mechanism to achieve something. It is not the end goal. And that's where most of the businesses are missing this point, including government. I attend so many forums and everybody talks about AI. But when we ask them that why you want AI, the answer is not clear. Mm. So when we are embracing AI, we need to be very, very clear on what is the objective, how we are improving the processes and what is the output we are expecting. That is very, very important. Now, coming back to your question, probably healthcare is one of the key areas and AI will be boon for healthcare. And AI will be boon for even, I, I would say, security as well, because we want to protect our society. How to protect our society? We need to, we, we are embracing a lot of data. We are collecting a lot of data. But collection of the data is, again, one step. But how we are going to deal with the data is the next thing. And AI will definitely help us a lot uh, in, in that area. Um, Sunaina, AI going to be helping us in cybersecurity or scaring us in, in cybersecurity? Because technically you could soon be having yeah. um, not just AI, yeah. but potential other technologies like quantum computing, yeah. you know, giving you more headaches than you want to deal with in cybersecurity. Yeah, I think there's a lot of scaremongering when we talk about AI and security. And I think that, like you just mentioned, quantum computing, okay, the biggest race is now going to be our, our current crypto algorithms, how long do we have left before someone can decrypt them? Um, so that's a big chase and that's a big run that we're going for. But at the same time, I see it as an opportunity to create um, safer encryption algorithms, right? So um, I think that that should be the conversation and that should be the big push and, what, and how we can leverage quantum computing for security in creating um, encryption models that we, have, we haven't seen yet and that can create history. Um, another thing is when we talk about, when we talk about AI and cybersecurity, there's, there's two sides of it. You have security for AI. 
which is less spoken about. So how do we create AI models that are secured by design from the beginning? And um, that's a big conversation. So when we're talking about um, um, creating machine learning models and the harnessing of this data, well, how are we making sure that a hacker can't come and spoof the data that's in there or um, create an adversarial attack, for example? And then the other aspect of AI and cybersecurity <clears throat> is um, using AI for cybersecurity. So uh, taking our current cybersecurity solutions and integrating AI into it so that it's faster and better and uh, performs better as well. So mm. it depends on how we, how we look at it. I think when we look at the cybersecurity landscape and AI from a hacker's perspective, um, you can see that hackers are using our current cyber threats. So what we currently have, such as like malware and um, phishing, for example, um, but doing it at a better and a faster rate. So now we're seeing incidents where we have um, AI based malware that's able to adapt and change and go unnoticed for a really long time, which we didn't see before. So we're still seeing the same threats, but we're seeing, seeing them at a standard that's much higher and much faster. Uh, before, so when the solo wind cyber attack happened, there was a malware that was within the network, but it was in, within the network for months that went undetected. We can do an attack like that within the space of weeks. We don't need months anymore. Um, so from a cybersecurity industry, um, and especially for SMEs, it's a big chase on creating products and solutions that are first, first of all, uh, secure by design, and then to be able to take those products and to integrate them into any sort of a solution or market or industry to, uh, so everyone can benefit from cybersecurity at a cost that's not so extravagant how, how, how it is today, I would say. Right, Ivana, if I could just lead from that, come back to the question of, of AI governance. Um, you, you spoke a lot about what I would call micro AI governance from the point of view of a company taking care of its data and how is it rolling out AI. There's also a larger question, isn't there, about how is AI governance happening at a global level? Because it has to be happen at a global level. You've already seen the controversies in companies like OpenAI with, you know, and Ilya now leaving to set up his own thing. How is artificial general intelligence being monitored? How can you make sure that AI systems can't suddenly become sentient and wipe out mankind? Those are probably conversations that we should be having because we can't wait for the threat to actually come real and then say, oh, we need to figure out how do we, how do we deal with this? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. So governance comes in many different levels, right? So we all have to work together. The companies, the individuals, the governments, the schools, everything. Governance comes all levels. Now, I think and that um, there are conversations happening globally. The UK played a great role with the UK um, summits with the, the Bletchley Park Declaration, uh, bringing together a lot of countries coming and, and signing to some points, bringing societies together on safe, responsible and secure AI. But there is one thing that I really want to say, which is we're not starting from scratch in the sense that all over the world we do have privacy regulations, we do have human rights laws, we do have consumer protection, we do have legislation. And too often what has happened over the last few years has been the AI has been a fantastic excuse to break these existing laws. So we could all focus on, you know, what is legislation that we need in the future. So the key question for me is, how do we bring artificial intelligence and then risks that we know? Because it's all good that we talk about artificial general intelligence, mm. but we're not there yet. Well, where we are though, is artificial intelligence that we're already seeing perpetuating harms right now. For example, the softwareization of existing inequalities into our society through algorithms that play an editorial and an allocative functions and that therefore may end up discriminating. We are already seeing the cybersecurity risks that you already you spoke brilliantly about and we have already seen for example, the potential harms to our democratic viabilities through deep fakes. And the problem of deepfakes is not the deepfakes itself, it's our ecosystem which rewards divisive content. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's all good to talk about frontier AI, but we already know 
what is happening right now. And I sometimes I worry that the future and the focus of Frontier AI and AGI is taking us away from what we know now about the risks that we're facing and we're not looking into them enough. So it, the conversation needs to happen, but we need to be very cautious that we also need to think about what is happening right now and what we are facing. I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely uh, no, fair enough, but I, I guess the reason why people are worrying about some of the more existential risks is that there's a possibility that it was a lab leak that caused all of us to lock ourselves up in a room uh, for two years and for millions of people to die, right, because security wasn't taken care of in a lab. If you're playing around with biotech, if you're playing around with AGI, if you're playing around with ASI and doing so in insecure, in, in conditions that are less than perfectly secure, that has existential consequences that go beyond privacy and, uh, you know, someone's data out. I mean, those, those could have terrible consequences, but that could have even worse consequences. So if you think about it, Silicon Valley, where I live, usually has been on the side of rapid innovation, and we'll apologize after the fact. So if you think about it... You may not have an after to apologize in this case. But that's the point. When social media occurred, when internet and e-commerce was happening, it was Silicon Valley leading the way with the innovation and Washington DC in America and then other parts of the world was chasing their tails trying to get regulation. This is the first time, Vikram, yeah. that we've seen Silicon Valley right out at the out, uh, outset. Sam Altman, Elon Musk, uh, make a beeline towards Washington DC asking for regulation. And as a society- Sam Altman less so than, <laughs> than some of the other names. Well, he was, he was in front of Congress saying we need to regulate this thing. And I think there's a reason in that. We as a society need to pay cognizance to that. The developers of AI, the people who are working on these more powerful models and pushing the frontier on AGI, et cetera, recognize that for the first time we have a technology that is able to make decisions. We've never had that situation in the past. Technology was always aiding human beings, adding to our efficiency, automation. Now it's making decisions and generating intelligence like, like the human brain can. But I want to focus also on the reason we shouldn't over-regulate AI and not let this fear-mongering get ahead of us is the profound impact AI is having on our lives. And let me make this real. We've all had experiences where we're driving on a freeway, highway, with the family, roadside assistance, flat tire, you need help. Typically, this process would take about 45 minutes for somebody to come on the phone, process your claims, send you help, etc. Now with Gen AI, some of these insurance companies are able to deliver that in less than 10 minutes. Is it great for society, great for consumer, great for business? Yes, all right. One of my customers, one of India's largest motorcycle brands is using AI to understand consumer sentiments, et cetera. So there are massive positive implications, healthcare, cure of cancer, but the flip side, and it doesn't just have to be regulation and government legislation. You speak about the changes in human lives and society and what will the world look like in three years? We need legal frameworks now to emerge. Mm. A few months ago, we saw Air Canada get challenged in the Canadian jurisdiction. A consumer of Air Canada took it to court and said, your chatbot discriminated against me. Yep. Who lost the case? Not the provider of the AI model, not the consumer, Air Canada. All right. So companies, legal jurisdictions, we all have to adapt. It is a, a moment of transition. It's moving really fast. And I think the risk of us doing this fear mongering is what we saw with the EU Act, where we need government's intervention, right. but if the governments overstep, they could stifle the pace of innovation. Right. right. I mean, I know I'm standing between everyone and lunch, but just bear with us. I'm going to get final thoughts on this, and we'll also try and see if we are ruining your appetite or not <laughs> uh, with, with what we're hearing. Um, the, the, the concerns, yes, fear mongering can lead to excessive regulation, but as he was saying, this is the first time there's a technology that is potentially capable of thinking for itself. It's also potentially the first time we have a technology that is capable of recursively self-improving at a very fast rate, and that adds to the risks, yep. right? Would you agree with that? Yes, 100%, and I think um, how what Ivana was saying about making sure, because these data sets are trained on data, and if the data is biased, and if the data is incorrect, then that's going to have a terrible impact on the future of what these algorithms are resulting in because the data is based on the past. So um, it's important for those conversations to be open and it, and it shouldn't just be you know, an AI expert, a developer 
or a, uh, a security specialist, it needs to be everybody involved within those yeah. conversations. And in the security industry, we've seen for so long the disconnect between what security are doing and what everyone else in the business are doing. I've been in conversations in rooms with developers saying, we have a security team, but we don't know who they are. And these are some of the big tech companies. So there's been such a massive disconnect, but what we saw um, at Apple's um, WVD conference where they released their personal AI, um, for the first time ever, I felt like the conversation was more about security than what the actual product was, because everyone said, how are you securing this? And they spoke about um, creating their own in-house private cloud. So essentially what they're saying is that we're not harnessing any user data. Users make requests and the data is gonna be removed. So this is the first time a big company like Apple have spoken about security as being sort of a, the, the positive part of their product. And we need to see more of that. Security can't be an afterthought, especially when it comes to um, AI models or machine learning models, it needs to be like I said before, it needs to be designed within the process. Um, that's the only way we can create these ethical AI algorithms, with ha including everyone in the conversation, and it shouldn't be segregated with being like you know a certain group of people, for sure. All right, last word from you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I, I strongly believe that uh, AI should have human override. It need not be uh, allowed to run on its own. I don't know the case details, but if that company would have relied on automated decision making using bot, then I'm more than happy that company lost the case. It should never happen. It, AI should be regulated really well because if you do data poisoning, if there is any other mistakes, then it is life threatening for sure. So it is a big genie. If it is not controlled really well, it can kill you. Well, so lots of promises of the new tech order lots of challenges as well and i think it's really going to be important to figure out how best we are navigating this the the downside and the catches and what the issues are both on the positive side and on the downside there are lots of permutations and combinations that i think have to be weighed in and i also think it's important to keep the discussion yeah, going yeah. because that's the only way yeah. that it moves from being a subject for a some for an AI governance officer or a cyber you know, security yeah, yeah, yeah. person and becomes part of the mainstream dialogue. And I think yeah. it's really important. Yeah.